<laughs> so we are sitting in Hackney Downs in London and we're meeting in person for the first time and I'm really aware that we've come from very different places. You've come in from Montana, I've come from Oxford. Rather than only thinking where have we come from physically recently, I want to start by sharing where we've each come from psychologically in a world view uh, and I'm and I'm gonna kick off and I so in the early 1990s I went to university to study economics I believed that economics as the mother tongue of public policy was mm. going to give me the framing the language to help transform the world and I quickly got very frustrated and disillusioned because it begins with supply and demand on day one welcome to economics that's the diagram that's the diagram the Samuelson diagram. Yes. So economics, meaning ikos nomos, the art of household management, <laughs> a much needed art. But where's the household? Where's the household? And the household was brought down to probably the level of the nation, actually, thanks to Adam Smith's framing, the household being the nation. How do we make a nation thrive? We focus on the market. And that puts price at the center of our concern from day one. Hmm. And Anything that falls outside that price contract is called an externality. So if you ask an economist, how should I talk about climate change? How should I talk about ecological breakdown? How should I talk about air pollution? They'll say, oh, yeah, we, we, we've got a frame for that. It's an environmental externality. Right. And, and there begins right. all the problems. Because if we, if we don't begin with supply and demand, if we begin saying human economies are part of human societies and humanity is part of the living world and we begin to understand the ecos the household mm. as the planetary household we would have an utterly different economics but absolutely but we're still not there and i found myself rebelling against what i was taught not knowing what i was seeking for until i actually stepped outside the economics and found work like yours in biomimicry mm. found work like herman daly and others and donella meadows and systems thinking who are reframing from the whole and then we move in the real world the real world the living world and the, and yeah. what makes sense in the living world yeah. the economics that i was taught is still taught in so many universities and i still yeah. find myself having to explain an alternative frame so I want to know where you are coming from and what led you to do this. You know, I grew up in a time in, in the environmental movement when um, we pitied the polar bears. Pity was the emotion for the natural world. So much of what I read was about pitying these organisms. Mm. The most competent organisms on the planet are not always this big-brained one. They're the, they're the consummate engineers, these organisms consummate physicists, consummate chemists. I have nothing but respect for them, mm. not pity. Mm. I'm trying to find our mentors yes. in these evolutionary elders. And you know how you feel? Do you have a mentor? Can you think of mentors in your life? She's sitting in front of me. Oh, cute! <laughs> Uh-oh, now we're in trouble. Um, if you were somewhere and someone stood up and began to belittle me. What would Kate Raworth do? I think you'd probably stand up in the audience, <laughs> march over to that person and say, I beg to differ, because that's what we do for our mentors. Mm. We are so grateful mm. and we have such respect, right? Mm. That's, the ch that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. I'm trying to put these, these, these organisms back into our everyday consciousness as phenomenal, phenomenal beings. And I've always been trying to do that. Mm. So biomimicry, I was writing all of these books about wildlife habitats and how they live on these, how they not just live in these habitats, make that, create the habitats. Yeah. And that, how the habitats co-create them yeah. and what you might find in the natural world. And I was writing all these books. And then I thought, wait a minute, these organisms, are so competent in everything we're trying to figure out how to do. Surely there must be a profession in which a botanist sits down with a solar engineer and says, oh, this is how photosynthesis works. 
very ubiquitous, common raw materials. The solar cells are these leaves. They're, they're also, you know, heat radiators, and they're also, you know, protecting the tree from pests. And there's lots of things they do, but they also are these solar harvesters that turn the solar energy into stored chemical energy. Surely they work together. And I, that was just naivete. I didn't know much about how things were really designed or how engineers really worked. But they right. do not take biology classes, uh -huh. and they did not have biologists there. So I went looking for that. Anytime I saw a scientist learning about biology, talking to somebody who makes our world, I would copy the paper, and then I had enough of them that I had to put them in a folder, and I named the folder. That's, I went to the Webster's Dictionary, and did bio means life, mimesis ah. means to imitate in Greek, and that's a mouthful, biomimesis. I think I'll say biomimicry. I named the folder that. Yeah. And then I just collected and collected and collected, wrote another book, and I had four uh, drawers in a Hun filing cabinet. I walked by it one day and I said, this is a field that has no name. The work I do with Donut Economics, which asks how can how can we meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet? And from, from the <laughs> day I first drew this diagram of the, a, a donut shaped diagram, leave no one in the hole falling short on the essentials mm. of life. Don't overshoot the life supporting systems of our planetary home. Yeah. One of the first things that happened was people wanted to bring it down to a place because that was for the whole world and, and people in cities and mm. towns. So what, what would it mean to aim to do that here? The ambitious question for any 21st century place is how can this place be a home to thriving people in an ecologically thriving place yeah. while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? So it's yeah. got local aspirations, thriving people yes. in an ecologically thriving place, but yes. recognizing through global supply chains, through the teleconnections of climate change, we are impacting people and planet worldwide and have a responsibility for that too. That's right. That's and right. one of the questions we invite places to explore is, is the question that comes right out of your work. How can this city aim to be as generous as the wildland next, next door? door. So, so we're sitting in a city. What would it mean if we said, how could this city be as generous as the wildland next door? Yeah. Where, where, where do we begin with approaching that? Well, we change our desire, first of all. <laughs> we want to live in a lush and livable place. Yes. So your work about thriving and our work together, that's the right goal. Yes. That's that goal that makes natural selection really work, right? It always goes towards more thriving, right? So you start there, and then somebody comes to you and says, what's a biomimetic city? If you use biomimicry yeah. to make a biomimetic city, yeah. what would it be like? Yeah. Well, come with me to the wild land next door. Because I know that healthy means a certain thing when you go into a healthy ecosystem. It's kind of what I was talking about. It's not just how it feels there, but it's what it produces, right? Like what it, the outcome, th this, this exhale of goodness, right? Can we, with all of our brains, mm. design in a way that acre or hectare per hectare, we store as much water, we cycle as many nutrients, we support as much habitat, right, as the wildland next door. Now, how do you do that? You've got the building, yeah. and you've got the landscaping around it, and most people would say, just plant more trees. Mm -hmm. And we're definitely going to, it's going to be green and leafy and mm -hmm. lovely. Mm -hmm. Believe me, this will be a lush place when we're done. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the buildings, the sidewalks, the parking lots, may they rest Maybe. in peace. <laughs> um, they, they all have to pull their ecological weight. Mm. Every surface becomes important. If you look into the natural world, you know, that bark that I'm staring at right now has all these lichen on it. That yeah. Every surface is important, all the crevices. What if our buildings were actually designed to be welcoming to wildlife, to nest on them? It's called habitexture.
and people are happy actually, texture. Happy texture. People are actually doing it. And when when it happens, it usually happens accidentally. Like in Austin, Texas, have you ever been to the bridge that has the bats? I've seen it, but it's a, it was an accident. It, it was an accidental yeah. thing where where they put the the bridge members in, and they happened to be so close together that the bats dug them, and then all the bats now come out like a like beautiful smoke rings, you know, at a certain time of of evening, and the whole community comes down and does music and it became a celebration for the community right imagine if we designed in that way yeah. right imagine if um storm water was a welcome thing because it was soaking deeply into bioswales right imagine if 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 you have a metric and i've seen it happen mm. you give a, you give somebody a metric mm. it's hot as heck in a factory in georgia okay interface mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hot as heck and we go to the wild land next door, mm -hmm. and it's 15 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the hot and dirty under the trees. Under the trees. Mm. So, interestingly, we say, okay, how can we make this happen? You know, building shell and beyond. We can put solar awnings up. We can do trees. There's all kinds of ways you can make it cooler. We're going to get rid of that black asphalt. You know, you're all kinds of ways. Well, interestingly, the folks inside the factory say, hey, wait a minute. Why are you stopping at outside the building? It's hot and dirty in here. We would like it to be cool in here too. Right, right. And ventilation in here too. So you begin to, you know, we started from the, from the this is biomimicry 3.8. We do this work yeah. where we study the reference habitat. We study the current performance of the spot that we're building or retrofitting. And then we begin to design into the, into the gap. And we started from the outside, um, from the shell out, but very quickly realized this is a health, this is health and wellness for the people. This is social, social justice for the people within the building as well. So now we're sort of bringing these phytoremediation walls, meaning walls that take some of the uh, pollutants and actually phytoremediate them. You know, putting, putting um, oxygen producing, um, plants nearer and closer to people. All of those things that we want to have happen outside the walls, we're also starting to bring in into the walls as well. Some research has shown that in, in neighborhoods that have very low tree coverage, and so you have this great heat island effect, yep. right? And so kids are sitting in schools where they are sweltering. That's right. And research has shown that with every degree increase in temperature, the child's ability to learn, to retain, goes down. So you've just got a very direct connection between who lives in neighborhoods right. that have the shade of trees, who doesn't, who doesn't. whose low-income neighborhoods right. don't have the shade, and those kids can't learn in school, and so you've got a direct connection That's between right. the ecology of place right. and the social injustice of opportunity, That's right. and those children have, you know, be, not being able to transform their future. And for me, that yeah. just... So and as the rates, it's yeah. the greenest parts of cities yeah, are of the richest or the high, highest real estate value. Yes. We learned it during the pandemic. How many people had to do walk around their block and began to notice yeah. what they didn't have, yeah. right? And what, what they did have. There's a, there's a huge inequality. I see this as a big environmental justice piece. Yes, yes. What do you see is the role of mm. art in words, yeah. in image, in all forms of art, what? Yeah. How? How can art be part of helping Huge us? Huge part of it. Huge part of it. What the world needs now, in addition to love, is a vision of a world that works. We are all, as Joanna Macy says, a part of the great unraveling, and we know we are. And I think. That sort of looseness that we have right now, that's when, when an ecosystem collapses with a fire or whatever, all of those nutrients become available. There's a looseness, the great resignation, the fact that we had that pandemic and we realized, oh, we can do something very, very different here, right? That, we are primed for the next reorganization, right? Into the world we actually want. And art can give us a glimpse of that world.